Amen. We're going to turn this morning in God's Word to the book of Acts, the story of God's work in the early church. Um, Acts chapter 8, and we're going to be telling the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And um, last week, Pastor Steve Frieswick, one of our missionaries, preached on what's called the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, this call to go out into all the world and to share the good news of Jesus. And one of the pictures that he showed was this picture, which I thought was kind of an interesting connection because he didn't know I was preaching on this text this week, and yet he mentioned this as one of his illustrations. So it's kind of fun how God works from week to week even in in these things. There's a couple other pictures I want to show just to give a little bit of background to this text this morning. The first is a map of Palestine. And in this story, Philip is told he's been in Samaria, so kind of the center there. You can see the word Samaria maybe kind of printed across the center of the map. He's told to go to a road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, which roughly is that, go back a second, roughly is that green line along the bottom of the map. We don't know exactly where he was, if it was that road or somewhere else, but uh, that's kind of the path he's taking. Gaza is at the end of that green line right on the seacoast. See, isn't, isn't technology wonderful? You can do things like that with it. It's kind of fun. So now you can see it up close. So somewhere along that line, you can see there's even a little tag, Ethiopian eunuch is baptized along this road. Acts 8, verse 38. So that's the text we're going to read this morning. So now our next, uh, next slide. Um, this is a picture of kind of what that landscape around there looks like. It's called the Desert Road. Um, it's not desert in the sense that sometimes maybe we would think of it, you know, nothing but sand dunes, but it's uh, wilderness maybe is a, is a good name. You can see there's some scrubby stuff on the landscape, but it's... Um, you know, it is kind of a desolate, rocky uh, landscape there. So there's not much along that road, and, and you notice there's not much water there, which is one of the things that's going to factor into the story. So he's meeting a man from Ethiopia, and that brings us to our next slide here. Um, Ethiopia in the ancient world referred to what we now call, well, really, it refers to anything below Egypt. So the man that we're going to meet today in our text, uh, along with Philip, is from what we now call Sudan. You can see the kind of temple-looking thing, official-looking building there down towards the bottom of the map. That's about where he's from. And where the candle is up in the top is Judea, Jerusalem, where, um, near where our story takes place. And this man is a government official from Ethiopia, and he's made that long journey up the Nile River, then taken his chariot over to Jerusalem, and now in our story today, he's on the way back. And one more, just to talk about uh, the gospel crosses cultures. And we want to see in the next picture, um, it's a very different culture that he's in. You think about that map that I looked at, or the picture that we looked at earlier in the landscape there. This is a lot of desert and sand. These are some of the the, uh, pyramids of uh, uh, what's now Sudan. Uh, You can see they look even a little different than the ones maybe you're familiar with seeing in Egypt. And so one of the things that we see is that the gospel is always building bridges between different places where people are and um, how they need to hear, how the the message of Jesus, the the gospel of Jesus comes to a new place. But this isn't just, you know, between like us and Sudan or something like that, that it has to build those bridges. But as we read this morning about the, the sinful nature and life in the spirit, The gospel has to cross that bridge between where we are at to the culture that we would want to embrace for ourselves and the kingdom of God into which God calls us by his spirit. And so we're going to think about some of the ways that the the gospel meets us and calls us into the place where God is working this morning. With that in mind, let's uh, read our text today from Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, there's one more picture I want to share with you this morning as we think about what we just read, and I think it's a picture you can recognize immediately, a picture of Fairlawn Church. However, this is not the perspective of Fairlawn Church that I think most of us have on a regular basis, and so I want to imagine this morning that you are somebody who lives in the neighborhood around the church here. Maybe you live on Fairlawn Street, which, if you don't know, is that street that dead-end street that kind of ends at the parking lot back here. And you live on Fairlawn Street, and every Sunday, maybe if you're going out to get your cup of coffee in the morning or whatever it is that you do on Sunday mornings, you notice that there's a lot of cars in the parking lot here. And you notice that maybe there's people in the summer who kind of mill about out there, and they seem to be having a good time just talking and visiting afterwards. And... You notice that there's cars that show up different times through the week, too. But you don't really think about it too much. But every once in a while, as you're going for your morning walk, you come through the back of the parking lot, and you see this, and you think to yourself, wait a second, what does go on in that building? What are those people seeing? What are they doing that that keeps them going there week after week? And you think to, maybe you think to yourself, I mean, I can know things about God without going to that building, and maybe I can even try to be a pretty nice person without going to that building, but what is it that they do? What is it that's different that happens in that building that I don't know about? Sometimes just looking at things from a different perspective puts questions in our minds. It helps us to understand what God may be doing in a certain situation. So just keep that picture in the back of your mind as we look at the rest of this text this morning. You know, one of the big questions that's on a lot of people's minds in the church these days is how we share the message of Jesus with the people around us. How do we grow the church? And I said over the last couple of weeks that I'm doing this series, sermon series called You Asked For It, which is just different things that people have asked me over the years. You know, I'd love to hear a sermon on that topic or that book of the Bible or something. And a while back, somebody had said, I wish we could have a sermon on evangelism. I wish we could have a sermon on how to talk about what God is doing in our life with the people around us. And so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. And when we think about evangelism, when we think about sharing the good news of Jesus with each other and with our world, I want us to start by imagining how the God of the Bible meets people in the homes that surround this church, maybe in your own home as well. We talked about the people who live down the road from church here. Our story this morning tells us about another man who lived down the road from church, just a little further down the road. It was maybe 1,200, 1,500 miles down the road. He lived in a region that the ancient world thought of as the very ends of the earth. Anything beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire was novel to them, and this was pretty far beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire even with a chariot, and maybe taking advantage of the boat trip that he could make up and down the waters of the Nile. This would have been luxurious travel by ancient standards, but this was still a three-week trip for this visitor to be making from Jerusalem to his homeland. And the traveler that we meet this day is a black man. He was a high-ranking official in the government of Ethiopia, a figure today that we probably call the Secretary of the Treasury or something like that. 
And somehow in his far-flung place, this man had heard about the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. He had started to ask questions, and maybe even more miraculously, he had managed to work it out so that he could make a trip across all of that distance to go to Jerusalem and ask those questions in the place where God was worshipped. Now, we don't know how long he stayed in Jerusalem or what he did there as a eunuch. He probably would have been barred from entering the temple courts themselves due to his sexual condition. But whatever it was, he had made his visit, and now on the first day of his trip back, he was on the lonely stretch of road down to Gaza, the last stop before the stretch of desert heading towards Egypt. He was sitting in his chariot, his caravan slowly lumbering back home, and he's reading a scroll that he picked up in Jerusalem. The passage that he's reading is one that we know today as Isaiah chapter 53. If you want to see the larger context, you can look it up in your Bible. It's on page 731, part of the Old Testament. And he had been told when he bought the scroll that this was a very important prophecy. But on reading it, he found that this prophecy had something to do with lambs and slaughter and silent sheep. And it was about someone deprived of of justice and left without descendants. Now again, maybe for many of us, those are familiar words. But for this man, and, and maybe for others of us here, they were very unfamiliar. They aren't the only words on the scroll, but those are the words that caught his attention. And he he kept reading them a few times through aloud, as most people read in those days, puzzling over them each time, just to make sure he didn't miss anything. And then all of a sudden, he noticed that his party isn't traveling alone anymore. A man had run up to the chariot as it crept along, and his glance caught the Ethiopian officials with a knowing smile. And he asked the question that probably was obvious to both of them. You don't really understand what you're reading about, do you? Now today, we don't think much of a question like that. I mean, we would feel very comfortable asking that question, most of us, to people in authority over us. But in that day, it was a bold question addressed from a commoner to someone who was obviously a high-ranking official. But the question was asked without disrespect It was framed without arrogance or hostility, and so it met a soft landing. And one of the things we see about sharing our faith is that when bold questions are asked at the right moment, they can have a life-changing significance. Now, I want to step back out of the story for a moment and talk about what happened up to this point. In the book of Acts, we find a number of examples of times when the gospel is shared, but most of those are public. Now, we know that there are private examples, too. The the book of Acts talks in the early church about how church leaders went from house to house to house, sharing the good news about Jesus and teaching and, and answering questions. So we know that this kind of thing happened, but this is actually one of the few glimpses that we have in the Bible of one on one evangelism, one on one discipleship happening. And so far, we've tried to look at this story from the perspective of a man who's staring at the gospel from the outside, who's looking at this story of Jesus saying, I I don't get where all of this is going. And some of us here might feel like we're in that chariot. Maybe for some of us, we hear words like redemption or salvation in Jesus Christ or holiness, and they kind of float around us. But we have a hard time putting all of those things together. And that may be true, not just of people who are newer to the church or to the Christian faith, but it may be true for some of us who have been in the church our whole life, where these words have always, we've always struggled, even though we believe them, we've always struggled to put them together. Others of us may find ourselves in the position of Philip. Maybe we have people asking us questions, or we're surrounded by by comments about Jesus or about life in general, and we're trying to figure out how to answer those. Why did God put us here? We hadn't intended to share the gospel with an important foreign official, but what Philip is doing is allowing himself to be in the right place at the right time to simply ask a good question. One of the things that we see, I think, is that all of us at various times are both learners and students of the gospel. Throughout our lives, this continues. We don't graduate to being teachers only simply because we've been in the church for a certain number of years. And just because we are new to the church doesn't mean that we don't have questions we can ask and things that we can help others understand. 
See, being a witness for Jesus is not always about having exactly the right answers at the right time. But being a follower of Jesus, more often than not, is about trying to understand how the Spirit brings the story of Jesus to bear on a particular situation, a particular perspective, a particular person. And one of the things that can help in that is a bold, well-placed question can open the door more clearly sometimes than all of the bold answers in the world. Do you understand? That question hung in the air for just a moment as the eunuch tried to size up the stranger's intent and finally he just broke the silence and admitted, no, I don't understand this. I need some explanation before this makes sense. And within a few minutes, he had invited Philip, the Christian missionary, to see the world from his perspective. Now again, think about this. Philip's never ridden in a chariot of an Ethiopian official before. I think we could say that with some degree of confidence. This is a first-time thing for him. He's never had to think about what the world looks like for somebody who lived thousands, of, you know, hundreds, even thousand miles away, who spoke a different language, who lived in a different culture, whose landscape looked very different. And so he has to sit down and listen to the questions that this man asked. So this business of a slaughtered lamb, of a man deprived of justice and left without descendants, what's it all about? And for the next number of miles, we don't know how many, he and Philip talked, beginning with what we know today is Isaiah chapter 53. They talked about Jesus and they talked about the good news of God's kingdom. And they talked about the forgiveness of sins and they talked about the resurrection of the dead and they talked about salvation. They talked about the word of God, the scriptures. Apparently this man had somehow in his previous experiences come into contact with this idea that God had spoken to people through the Bible. And he talked about how the scriptures revealed the story of the person and work of Jesus and pointed to what God would do through Jesus someday. And as they talked, something began to make sense. Now, most likely this man who had come from the far corners of the earth to Jerusalem had never heard about Jesus, at least not before his trip to Jerusalem. Maybe as he was milling about Jerusalem, somebody mentioned this, you know, this guy who had been you know, a teacher there a few years earlier and had been put to death on a cross and there was still some controversy and comments about him. But certainly this man did not have the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John like we do, to tell him about Jesus' life and ministry. What he had was a souvenir scroll, a scroll of Isaiah and the stories that the stranger had told as they went along the road. But one of the things we see here too is that God's word is a powerful thing. God says in his word, I will not let my word return to me empty. And so as Philip goes along, continuing to make connections back to the Bible, back to the scriptures, this man became aware of his own sin, his need for salvation. He became aware of the wonder that God had provided that salvation in Jesus. And as I talked about baptism, we can think about that as we looked at the baptismal font here. As he talked about baptism and its symbol that God would wash away sins through Jesus and he claims us as his own in Christ. Something clicked in this man's mind and he spotted water along the road and looked at Philip. Is there really anything that would prevent me from being baptized, he asked. Two of them agreed that baptism would be appropriate. They got out of the chariot, went down into the water. And Philip put that water on him that laid God's claim on his life. And then just as suddenly as it had all started, it was gone. The stranger disappeared. And the Ethiopian was left to continue on his way back home alone. So what happened that made the story of Jesus make sense to the man from Ethiopia? What is it that helps us in this story to understand what it means to share Jesus with the people around us? Well, certainly we can say the Holy Spirit was involved, right? Evangelism, discipleship is always a work of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit, after all, led Philip into the desert. The Spirit told Philip to go near the chariot. The Spirit worked things out so that the Ethiopian man just happened to be reading a passage from Isaiah as Philip walked up. 
So the Spirit always has to be involved. God always has to be involved. But there's also a willingness on Philip's part here to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. He could have said, you know, I've, I've been in Samaria. I've had a good ministry here. Things are going fairly well. I had a crazy idea that I should leave here and go somewhere else. Especially out in the desert. I mean, what's going to happen out there? But he didn't. Instead, he allowed himself to be brought to a place where the Spirit was preparing a way for God's Word to take root. And even as he saw the chariot and, and maybe even heard the man reading, he could have said to himself, I, I don't have anything in common with that guy. I mean, he's so different than me. I, I, what would I have to do with, you know, I'm a commoner. He's a, obviously an important official. He's obviously from a very different place than me. Why should I bother? And yet he allows himself to be in contact with somebody that maybe he wouldn't have expected to, to, to be part of his circle of, of acquaintances. To see the world as another person sees it. And then to understand how God's word connected to this man in a life-changing way and how he could help this Ethiopian man relate to the world around him from the perspective of God's word. Now, it's tempting in today's world, maybe in any world, to soften the message of the gospel and make it about something other than God's word. Every once in a while, I'll go to a church conference and I'll hear a speaker ask a question that goes something like this. If your church disappeared today, would your neighbors miss you? Now, in some ways, it's a good question because it's a question that forces us to think about, do we care about our neighbors? Do we care about the things that are going on around us in the community? Are we serving the poor? Are we caring for the homeless? Do we care about those who are struggling with, with things like addiction or, 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 or mental illness in the world around us? And as followers of Jesus, those are things that we should be paying attention to because those are things in our world, in our culture around us. But if that's the only question, would our neighbors miss us because we're doing things for them? If that's the only question we're asking as churches, we're kind of missing the point. Because being a good neighbor is part of sharing the gospel, but the church needs to know that it is not social action alone that sets it apart from the world. If you think about that picture that I showed at the beginning again, and I ask that question that should be on our minds, on maybe hopefully on people's minds around us, what goes on in that building that's different? Then I think we have to ask ourselves, what is it? Church shouldn't be just a place where there's good friendship and fellowship, although hopefully we have that, right? We want to get along with the people that we worship with each week. We want to know that we're on common ground with them. But that's not all. Is church just a place where moral norms are reaffirmed? Well, hopefully they are. Hopefully the guidance of God's word tells us a few things about how to live, but that's not, it's not just about good behavior. Is church just a place where we serve the neighbors around us, serve the world around us? Well, again, hopefully we should be doing that, but that's not what sets us apart. The Rotary, the Kiwanis Club can do that. No, what's different about the church is that it is a place where God's word is brought to bear on the issues of life. The church connects to people in their starting point and it leads back to the message of Jesus. The center of the church's message is Jesus and the salvation that we have in him. You know, all of us meet people every week who need to know Jesus Christ. It's something we should all be aware of because we should all be aware in our own lives that we're people who need Jesus But we meet them in all different kinds of places. Sometimes we meet people at an church, official church function. Maybe it's something that the church has done to, you know, organized to serve somewhere, a piece of bread, a community dinner we're serving in a couple of weeks. Or maybe it's an outreach event, the bike roadie or something like that that we do as a church, a Christmas concert. Maybe it's a worship service, somebody who was curious and, and came to, to see what goes on in this building. But more often, it's in something else that we're involved in. We meet people around us through a sports team we play on or in our work or some other place in the community. Some of you read the Today devotional, the daily devotionals, that, that, uh, booklets are, that are in the, the racks out, the literature racks out by the front doors. 
And you read a story actually on this passage this week about how God opened a door for conversation to happen between neighbors that would bring about a greater awareness of faith and of the life of the church. See, if we want to understand the message of this church or the message of the church in general, we need to pray that the Spirit would open our eyes and put us in places where we can hear how the gospel is or isn't connecting with the people around us. And we need to be looking at our own lives and saying, where are the places where the gospel connects with my life? Or the places maybe that I feel like it doesn't? And how do I grow from that point? You know, the people who need to hear the gospel probably won't be riding down the street in a chariot reading the book of Isaiah. I can't think of the last time I saw a chariot in Whitensville, for that matter. So it's not going to show up like that. Maybe they're not even thinking about the Christian faith at all. But there's something in their minds that relates to what the Bible says. Maybe it's something about the limits of personal expression and pleasure that they're indulging in. Or about the wages of sin and the ways in which things that they've done are kind of coming home to roost in ways that they are not comfortable with anymore. How do I find forgiveness? And so, as we think about the gospel both in each other's lives and in the lives of those around us, we can think about the power of a well-placed question. What do you think about? How does that make you feel? Does it bother you? Does it worry you? How might God be involved? We imagine how God, how the gospel looks from a different place from where you normally sit. And then we look for the road that leads from that place back to Jesus and back to worship because the center of the church's life, the center of the church's message is Jesus. In terms of this morning's passage, we start with this very passage of scripture, this very place where God has this person right now, has us right now. And it's from that point that we make the good news of Jesus known. Now, before we close today, I want to acknowledge that there may be some people here who say to themselves, you know, I I could never do that. I don't have the gifts to share the story of Jesus. I'm not sure about faith myself. I mean, I know I believe in Jesus, but that's about all I can say. And if that's where you are, I just encourage you to find a place to talk about that with people who can help you grow in your faith and walk with Jesus. Because there's nothing wrong with not knowing all the answers. Maybe for some of you, the Christian faith is a very new thing. And you say to yourself, I don't even know where to start. I certainly don't know all the answers. There's nothing wrong with not knowing all the answers. But there is something wrong with the desire not to be of service to Jesus or a desire not to want to grow in your walk with him. And so if you're struggling with with knowing enough of the answers this morning, find some good places where you can learn them. Find a good Bible study. Commit to reading God's word regularly yourself. Join a household group. Some of the things that we have going on starting in a couple of weeks. Look for good ways. There's all sorts of resources online to be able to connect and learn more about God's word. Ask the Holy Spirit to remind you again why it is that you came here this morning. Why you came to worship God and what it was that you were looking for. And that God would open your eyes to how that, he fills that in your life and in others around you. Now, we don't know what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch who went on his way rejoicing that day. Christian legend claims that he went back to his home country and he was instrumental in establishing the church there, despite his limited knowledge of the gospel. We don't know if that's true or not, but most likely we can say that what happened to him is what happened to a lot of other people who got to know Jesus. He came back and he simply told the story. You wouldn't believe what happened to me on the road back from Jerusalem down to Gaza that day. I was reading this book and I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense to me. And all of a sudden, there was this man standing there. And he asked me this question. And there was something in the question that I couldn't resist, just inviting him to hear more. And he told me about Jesus. And it's that story I want you to know too. One of my professors at Calvin College when I was a student there a number of years ago now, used to stay in his classes all the time. When you're trying to do theology, when you're trying to learn more about the Christian message, just tell the story. Just tell the story, the story about Jesus. Because that's what we want to do here at Fairlawn Church. 
Maybe this week, you need to take a walk take a, as you're out driving around. Walk around your neighborhood. Maybe park your car here in the parking lot and just walk around the building or walk down one of the streets and ask yourself, what do people around us see? Where do I need to see God working in my life in a different way? Ask the Spirit to help you see where the Word connects Jesus to that place or to the people, to you in a new way. And then be open to the task God has for you, to the place where the story of Jesus intersects with the story of where you are in that moment. The story we tell, Christ died for sins, Christ rose to give new life, Christ is coming again to restore all things, that story is never irrelevant and it's never in the wrong place. The Spirit connected that story to a foreigner a thousand miles away from home who understood it first along a desert road many years ago. And the Spirit continues to open doors for salvation on our streets today as well. Let's pray.